is the Pastor's Heart and Dominic Steele. And today, key reading and thinking for 2024 with Archie Poulos. Archie heads the ministry department at Sydney's Moore Theological College. And look, you may have expected as we think together about key books and key new ideas, a book list of, well, you'd probably be expecting theological books or books for pastors. But mostly today, our list is from outside the pastoral sphere, although with big pastoral consequences. Archie Poulos, thanks for coming in. I want us to talk about a number of secular books, yeah. but let's first talk about what I think is going to be the Christian book of the year for pastors, Andrew Hurd's Growth and Change. Oh, well, thanks, Dominic, and, and welcome uh, to everybody too. It's great to always be here with you. Can I just say that you asked me to come and speak about 10 books, which I am really excited about doing because I want us all to grow in curiosity, which means gathering whatever we can. Uh, but I think Andrew made me rethink that in the last week mm -hmm. because what I see is curiosity makes us interested, but it doesn't change us. Mm -hmm. And so Andrew's interview with you last week, everybody needs to re-watch that because what it's about is about changing and taking to heart what's being said and being serious about it. So it's not just being curious, it's about enacting things. And uh, so his book, I, I read it in draft form. Everybody needs to read it. You're absolutely right. It's a great challenge to us all. Now it's not out yet. They tell us it's on the boat on the way, but you've read the draft form. What were the big takeaways for you? Oh, the, it's the urgency and the necessity of being mission-minded. Uh, and we'll talk about that in some of the books that I want to talk about today. In fact, I've chosen three books really to push a bit further from where Andrew was. Uh, one of the things that Andrew captures in a way that is better than I can ever capture is how important it is, uh, the message that we have and the lostness of the lost. And uh, that's wonderful. And th what we discovered in our research in the Centre for Ministry Development, because I work not just mm. at Moore, but in the Centre for Ministry Development, is that people don't disagree with what Andrew said. In fact, everybody positively affirms what Andrew said, but there is a disjunction between what we desire and what we're convicted of and how we operate. And so what I want to talk to you about is looking at the secular world and what they have discovered about bridging that gap between conviction and action. Now, anecdotally, I feel what you've just said is right, that disjunction between the belief and actually putting it into practice. But you said you've researched it and found out we actually have that disjunction. Oh yeah, so I'll give you an example. Um, uh, I'm talking about our Sydney diocese, and so if you're outside of Sydney, you're going it to have to It may or may be, not be true. Yeah, it may or may not be true. Probably, if you're an, a serious evangelist, I probably. I suspect it is, and so there are things like, one of the things that people said they wanted to do was actually to be held accountable for how they were performing. So Andrew last week talked about outcomes, mm. uh, as inputs and outputs, those sorts of things, which which is really helpful. And uh, in our research, almost everybody said, yes, there is a level of accountability that we need to dial up and enhance. And then one of the people responded with, but I don't want to hold other people accountable because they'll hold me accountable. It's things like that. So we have this great desire because we have the precious gospel of Jesus Christ. How could we not uh, want to have the world know that? But there are sorts of, there are things that keep getting in the way. And so that's what we're trying to research. So what we're doing at the moment is we are writing 10 coaching modules in the Centre for Ministry Development that comes out of the research uh, that is walking beside people as we try to enact and move from the conviction and the desires into the practices that we engage in. Mm. Now, um Infinite Thinking, Simon mm. uh, Simic's book, um, The Infinite Game. Yeah. Um, he explores, I mean, secular writer, exploring the consequences of short and long-term thinking in business and life. <laughs> yeah, that sounds a long way from ministry, doesn't, doesn't it? it? <laughs> so why did you find that interesting and helpful? Uh, I mean, Sinek is, if you go and get him on YouTube, because he's got millions of uh, people who've watched him on YouTube, it's really helpful because I think in this book title, he has captured 
two different ways of thinking. So he uses the language of game, which we understand. So he talks about the finite and the infinite game. The finite game is what we are most used to. So the Olympics are coming up this year and you know how what happens in the Olympics. You've got individuals and you've got groups that compete with each other and the goal is to win. So we all understand the finite game. Uh, there's the, you know who the players are, you've got to play by the rules and the outcome is to win. Mm -hmm. And I think we bring that into our everyday life and into our ministry life. Mm -hmm. But Sinex says there are times where things are more important than winning the game. And so that's what he has explored. And as I was reading, I was thinking about when we were in high school, our neighbours had kids the same age as we were. And there's a two metre fence between our two houses. And so we used to play every afternoon a game that sort of resembled volleyball, but it wasn't. We didn't keep score or anything. We just kept hitting a ball over the fence backwards and forwards and different people would come in and, different, and mm -hmm. uh, on our side of the fence, their side of the fence. And for two hours, we just used it as a means of chatting with each other, but it was something to do. And that's what he means by the infinite game. In, the, in a finite game, you've got a very clear number of players. In the infinite game, people come and go. Well, that sounds like church. Yeah, it is, it sounds, <laughs> it is, it is like church. You can see why it resonates. Secondly, uh, in a finite game, there are clear rules that don't change. Well, we're in a world where the gospel of Jesus invades every aspect, no matter what you're experiencing in life. And so the rules change a little bit. And so that's part of the infinite game. And the third thing about the infinite game is that in a finite game, the goal is to win. And when the full time whistle blows, whoever's in front is the winner. In the infinite game, it just keeps going on. So it's the long term mm -hmm. uh, thinking that you were just speaking of. And Sinek uses the example of world poverty and overcoming world poverty. Mm -hmm. And as the Lord Jesus said, you'll always have the poor with you. Does that mean that you don't try and overcome world poverty? No, it's just that it's not a finite game. It's not going to be by 2026, we're going to overcome world poverty. Mm -hmm. It's something we keep engaging in all, all of the time. And what it means is there'll be people who come and go in it. There'll be people who give their resources, people who withdraw their resources. Uh, but what we, what we have is a greater purpose because our, a finite game, the purpose is to feed me and my family, maybe to tend the flock that I've been given here. But the infinite game is that the glory of the Lord will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. That's my daily prayer. Mm -hmm. And that's an infinite game because it's not going to happen in my lifetime, but in God's kindness, it can, we can contribute to that. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I liked about Sinek uh, in the infinite game. Um, I like and, that he was encouraging the corporates to think beyond the dollar yeah. and to, I mean, one of the lines I picked up was um, uh, CSB, uh, sorry, CVS said, yeah. um, above all else, our mission is to improve the lives of those we serve by making innovative and high quality health and pharmacy services safe, affordable and easy to access. Yeah. Therefore, we're not going to sell cigarettes. Yeah. And that was a cost blow to them. But in the long term, it was actually in line with the corporate yeah. philosophy they'd adopted. Yeah. And of course, these days, all you've got to do is read any leadership book, and they're always about uh, CSG, uh, you know, the whole social responsibility mm. and governance, those sorts of things, because we've seen such terrible failures, and we always see terrible failures. It's because in the bottom line often drives you. Uh, and it's interesting, in the whole leadership world, uh, the leadership industry started in the Christian world. Mm. And they actually assume Christian ethics. And then over the course of time, it then drifted significantly to the profit motive. And now you can actually see a turning back towards virtue and morality. So where do you think Sinek is in terms of the gospel? That's a really good question. I actually reread the book a few weeks ago to try and work out whether or not he's Christian. Often the way you can find... Because I felt a lot of Christian resonance there. Yeah, I think... I mean, God makes sense. You know, all mm. truth is God's truth. And so a lot of what he says is just observing the world properly, I mm -hmm. think. And so that resonates with Christian faith. In fact, when it doesn't resonate with Christian faith, they just haven't understood things properly. Uh, when I, I keep reading books to try and find worlds that are, words that are particularly uh, applicable in the Christian world and seldom used elsewhere. So, for example, if people keep using the word blessed, uh, that assumes there has to be a blesser mm. and so therefore it 
almost automatically means you have to believe in a divine power in God. Mm. And so yeah, I couldn't see that in the book anywhere. Um, but they're the sorts of things I look for. For those words... Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm... I- you can call me old fashioned, but I'm somebody who, when I buy the petrol, <laughs> I say to the guy, thanks very much. God bless. Yeah, you know, yeah. And I don't make a big deal of it, but I just want to just drop that in. Yeah. And they probably think I'm quaint and old fashioned. Yeah. yeah. Well, when I go shopping, I carry uh, those bags because you've got to use reusable bags now. Mm-hmm. And the bags are the CMS Summer School and the more college bags. Uh, so, and every now and then people say, what's that? And mm. uh, it's the same, the same sort of thing. I, had, I was at the shopping centre and they had a sign saying, save the world, use a, use a paper bag. And <laughs> I said to the guy, that's amazing. Jesus died to save the world. And you're saying I can do it just with a plastic bag. Yeah, anyway, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. The, 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 the cost of saving paper the world bag. is much greater than a plastic bag. And what a great introductory line. Oh, um, next book, Human Elements. So can I just go yeah. back to the Sinek one? Yeah. The places where he challenges us. Uh, I think are profound. So what we want to achieve is what you want to get out of the finite game, uh, out of the infinite game. Uh, it's a. I think you need to add to it, and this is why we've created it as a module, as a, a, a part of the modules that we are teaching. And that is, there are finite elements to what we do as well as infinite. One of the things is the finite will always get the loudest voice, mm-hmm. and things we do are finite. So our Easter services, our evangelistic outreaches, they are finite. Mm-hmm. Uh, they have an infinite purpose, but they are things that you've got to execute well. But the infinite purpose is to see the world transformed by Jesus, mm. and it, the, what the infinite game does, it does things like who else can you work with rather than just me in my local place? Because if I'm in my local place, I need to win this. And in fact, I need to probably win against the church next door. And so who else can you work with is what the infinite game challenges us with. Um, what is the big goal that we are trying to reach? It's not trying to reach budget. It's not trying to grow by 5% in the end. It's that the world might bow the knee willingly before mm. Jesus, before he returns. Uh, that's, uh, that's what our goal is. And so to be clear about that, which moves us from the specific immediate, you must have those finite goals. Um, so I think that's what Andrew was saying last mm. week. But the infinite goal is the urgent need and the opportunity that God gives us to do it. And the, thir- the third one is that uh, helping people to move from that immediate rush that we feel to win because if you know that you've got to win and it's time bound you can feel good about what you're doing as soon as you talk about the infinite game what measures can we use that indicate whether we're contributing Mm. to that infinite game that's much harder and that's one of the reasons why we push back I think against it and so therefore how do you juggle the immediate need the finite game with the infinite game and I think Sinek gives us some helpful advice along the way Mm, cool I'm looking forward to digging deeper yes. there. Human element, uh, Lauren Nordgren <laughs> and uh, David Schrondel. Oh, I don't know how you say the names, but yeah, that's right. So it, it's a 2022 book, so it's a fairly recent book. Yeah, and um, they're saying um, no amount of innovation, no amount of change that I'm arguing for is going to lead to adoption and acceptance unless I address the major resistance, um, inertia, effort, emotion, and reactance. Mm. Unpack those. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, I think they are coming from a different direction, but with the same goal as what Sinek does uh, in the, in the infinite game. Uh, and they use the, they start off with the example of a bullet. And if I say you fire a bullet and it can hit a target two kilometers away. What is it that enables the bullet to do that? What would your answer be? The power of the explosion Mm. that sent the bullet through the air is an enormous power and the resistance along the way is not that great. Well, that, that, yeah, that, that, that's their answer. Uh, they, they are researchers and they do it at a, uni, in a university level. I can imagine if you're firing yeah. it through water, it's going to be harder. Yeah, or, yeah, or, con- yeah. or Absolutely. Well, much harder if you're trying to fire it through concrete. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so what, what, they, what they've uh, worked out, when they ask that question, almost everybody says what enables the bullet to travel the two kilometres and hit the target is the gunpowder. Yep. And so they call that the fuel, and that's what we naturally think. But what enables it to go the two kilometres is the shape of the bullet. 
it's it, what, what they call it is the friction. So if you have a bullet that isn't perfectly symmetrical, it will go off target. Mm -hmm. If you have, two, if you have uh, any little marks on the bullet, the, res the resistance, the friction will not, will not enable it to go far enough. And so that's exactly what they look at. So what they, and they call the book the human element because what we naturally do is we think we've got to achieve something in business or in mm -hmm. ministry. And so we try harder. That is, we add more fuel mm -hmm. to do it. And what they say is what you've got to do is see what the resistance is because that's the easiest thing to change and will give you the best outcome. By the way, I talked before, I think it was last year, about a book called by Peter Senger, which says it has a million copies in print, which just means it's on a lot of shelves, that's all. Um, but he, he used the example of moving a boulder. And he says, you've got a big boulder you've got to move and, you, and it's hard to move. What we naturally do is we put more effort into pushing it. Mm -hmm. And so you bring somebody else beside you to push it. And he said, maybe you need to look on the other side of the boulder, the direction that you're trying to push it in. And is there a little pebble in the way? Mm -hmm. Because the little pebble may well be what's stopping all of the effort that you're putting in. So this is the sort of thing that they're picking up with their image of the bullet. And so they come up with these four areas. Uh, so the first one is inertia. And that is, we will naturally, inertia is that resistance to change. Mm -hmm. so, and as yeah. you tell us these four, yeah, yeah. give me a congregational example yeah, sure, as, we, I'll try as to. we go through. Yeah. Yeah. So um, we, what they say is inertia is we try to choose the familiar over the uncertainty and uh, over, the, uh, over the uncertain. And so we, we choose to uh, use the resources of our church to do what we're used to. And so I'll give you an example. Even though we are convinced, we're all convinced of no one has any hope without Jesus. We're all convinced of that. And yet when it comes to our Sunday gathering, so often congregation members and we want to be chaplains. Mm -hmm. to our congregation members. That is people, the world is scary and dangerous out there and church is my safe haven. I want you to care for me. Mm -hmm. And I want that to be the case too because it makes me feel good. I've done something mm -hmm. which is really helpful. And so that's an example of inertia that when you challenge me to do something that is different, it actually comes at a cost because there are limited resources. Mm -hmm. And so you've got to understand that doing something different has inertia involved in it. Uh, that, that's one of the one. That's why we have uh, our modules on discipler and on missioner, just to help us to understand where we are now, what our dispositions are, and what gets in the way of, willing, of being willing to make these changes. Mm. Um, so even so, so I'm, I'm going to ramble now, but even our home groups, our group groups, our community groups, whatever you want to call them, why do we have them? Uh, we will, uh, I don't want to say what the uh, reason that we're told is, but what, what do people feel when they go to home groups? It's, I have a group of people that I know well and can love and they love me. That's an important thing. But what if our home groups were to be groups where we explored, have you had a chance to talk to someone this week about Jesus? If you did, how did it go? Uh, what might get, what was it that got in the way of you being able to speak about Jesus so that in each week, week by week, our home groups could overcome that inertia of our resistance to be speaking about Jesus? So when you get your petrol, get the God bless, mm. that's a simple thing that we should all be doing, I mm. suspect. Mm, yeah. So that's inertia. Do you want me to go through yeah, the yeah, others? Keep going yeah. The others. Yeah, yeah, so the next one they come up with is effort. That is how much exertion is required to do it. And in our settings, we are comfortable people. And effort involves a loss of comfort. Uh, so we go to church, picking up the example I used a moment ago of wanting a chaplain. We go to church and we actually want to talk to our friends because I haven't seen them all week. I feel comfortable. They are dear and precious friends. But there is a world out there that doesn't know Jesus. One of the lovely things in our church is there are so many people who stand outside until church starts so they can talk to the people walking by. Mm -hmm. Now, I, they're people that I'm sure would love to catch up with their friends inside. 
mm. but they see the gospel need and say, how much effort is involved? It means I've got to find other means of keeping up with my friends because here is an opportunity to invite people to say hello to people. So the next time they walk past, they might be more activated into saying, oh, I wonder what's going on inside there. Mm. And so <clears throat> the question is, if you want to bring about change, how much effort is involved in doing it? Are there things you can do that can reduce unnecessary effort so you can act things so that the world might be filled with the glory of God as the waters cover the sea. That's the second. The third one is emotion, and that is there are negative feelings that people have towards change. And uh, that's change costs you. And so there are emotional costs involved, and you've got to own up to that. Mm. And then the fourth one is, as you said, reactance. And that is our natural desire as human beings, because we have grown up in a world where we are taught we're independence, and you keep talking about autonomy as well. Mm. Um, reactance is, if somebody tells me what to do, then my first response is, no, I'm mm. going to make that decision. And, uh, and I think what we've got to do is keep saying to people, this is the thing that you need to do, not because of duty, not because I'm commanding you, but you have been given the pearl of great price. You have been given the kingdom of God. And what you want to do is make sure others can see that as well. And, uh, and so it is Christian to challenge people to be transformed so that they might speak about Jesus to our lost world. So they're the four things, inertia, emotion, effort and reactance, which they explore. And I think it's helpful for any change that we want to bring about in our church life. Uh, you think about, have we got the fuel? Generally, the answer to that is yes. And if mm. the answer is no, well, you've got to try and schedule things to, to do that. But then as you want to enact it, what, is, what are the inertia things? What, what are the emotion things? What are the effort things? What are the reactance things that we are going to face that we might, when it's appropriate, minimize it? Or if it's inappropriate to minimize it, how are we going to progress it by sharing what we have as Christian people and why that drives us? And as we think about change, um, you and I were talking about a book from 1988. 1989, yeah. 1989. Yeah, yeah. well, that's a long time um, ago now. The After the Ball book. Yeah. Um, now, it was, it's a book, it's a secular book about the change that um, leaders in the homosexual community wanted to bring about in the culture. Um, now, but you think it's got some lessons for us in gospel oh, proclamation. Absolutely. It was written by two Harvard graduates, Kirk and Madsen. Uh, one was, I think, a neuroscientist, and the other one was a marketing guru. And it actually came about uh, the whole homosexual movement really uh, had, had impetus, impetus put to it in 1969 and, and uh, over Stonewall and things like that. And, they, and this is 20 years after the event. And they'd had the gay and lesbian ball and everybody was excited about it. And Kirk and Madsen after it said, we haven't done uh, well enough, we should have done more. And the reason for that is, uh, as people celebrated the ball, and you know, we're not gonna talk about those sorts of issues here, you can read other stuff on it, but um, uh, after people celebrate the ball, they thought, what great victories we have. And Kirk and Madsen got together and said, yes, but America, is not favorably disposed towards homosexuality. What we want to do is create a movement that changes the way that society thinks. And isn't that Christian? Isn't that what we were well, about? Well, it's the gospel yeah, to change exa the way exactly. society thinks. And you're saying there's a movement that wants to change the way society thinks in a different direction. Yeah, yeah, yeah that, that's right. And so what the, their book has become is the playbook about how you change a society. Now, uh, their solutions won't be the same as ours because, because of our virtues. There are things we will not do that they say you should do. But also the power of what we are doing lies in the gospel. But God uses his people as well. And I think that is the thing that the book can teach us. So if I can speak about it a little bit, do you want me to yeah, do that? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, the first thing that Kirk and Madsen do, and I think they were very brave in it, is that they actually diagnose the situation really well. Right, an honest assessment o honest. of where we're at. Yeah, and yeah. so if you go back to... Which is incidentally yeah. what we've been calling <laughs> some of our yes, people to yes, do absolutely. here. <laughs> and um, so if you think back to the finite game, you can think we are doing really well because we had this win. 
which is what Kirk and Madsen are objecting to. They're saying the fact that we have a ball is not a win because society hasn't been won over. And so they, they are very clear about it and they're very clear about why and they are challenging their own tribe to understand where it is failing and how it must change. So I think that that is really important. They identified uh, the problem, they, un they identified the situation they were in, they identified not just themselves and their failings, but the groups that they were trying to reach. Mm -hmm. And so they brought uh, psychological and scientific and marketing input into that. Secondly, they crafted a united response to the situation. That is, it's a response where they understood themselves, they understood the people they were trying to change, and they worked out how they, as a movement, as a group, could change society. And the third thing that they sought to do was to implement uh, that response. And as I say, part of uh, uh, the thing that you need to give them wonderful credit for is they said their movement was disorganised. And mm -hmm. it was. They're just all fractured. And so are we. Uh, you know, we don't, we don't work together very well. And the second thing that they said was our movement misbehaves. We parade immorality and we must stop doing that. And I think that's a challenge to us too. We have a whole lot of sins that are, it's not just the uh, Royal Commission and that sort of thing. There, there are things that we accept as Christian people that we shouldn't be accepting. Uh, the care for the poor, the care for the weak. Uh, you know, we should be seeking to do good to all people, mm -hmm. especially the household of believers, but we need to challenge ourselves in our affluence and all of those sorts of things. So they, they challenged misbehaviour and they challenged disorganisation and they said we have to change and they gave a way of bringing about this change and they have been successful and it's the playbook not just for the LGBTQI but all groups that are seeking to change society. And so as I step back even further, uh, one of the lessons for us is we often think society is neutral and we just roll with the waves and go with the tide. And what they have pointed out for me is society is not neutral. Society is, and the thought leaders of our society are working to undermine trust in Christian faith, in fact, mm. in all sorts of institutions. That's why you've got uh, soup being thrown at the Mona Lisa and things like that. Um, uh, they're seeking to undermine the structures that hold society together. And so it is not a neutral, it's actually malevolent. And so what one of the things that challenges me for is not just me and my local congregation, but we as Christians, because all Christians are tarred with the same brush, uh, what are we going to do to help change the perceptions that people have towards faith? I think that's actually a very helpful uh, book that you find in After the Ball. Mm, very helpful. Although I did notice um, when I Googled it, After the Ball, $300 Australian, <laughs> yes. uh, 199 US. Um, I was remembering that in this little book, Human Sexuality, uh, edited by Mark Thompson, the first uh, 20 odd pages were a summary of the After the Ball book. And it's, and it's a brilliant summary. It's, yeah. it's not just After the Ball, it's that whole movement from Stonewall in the 1960s through to where we're at today. And I've got the print copy here, but we in the show notes are going to link to the PDF copy and uh, you may find that a helpful read. Oh, it, it, and it's really easy to read too. It's, 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 it's a great little booklet. But think about it in terms of the sexuality debate, but also think about it in terms of well, what lessons are there here for the winning of the society and evangelism. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So if I can bring together those three books, I, I could speak of a whole mm. lot of them. And as I say, it's not just a, that I want to increase curiosity. I want to bridge that gulf between what we seek to do and how we do it. So at the Centre for Ministry Development, we have, as I said, these uh, 10 coaching modules. And what, what is the shape of all of them? They are all about looking at the reality that we are in. So after the ball was helpful in that. Secondly, it expands 
explores what we want to be. That is, we want to play the infinite game, not just, it's easy to play a finite game because a finite game you can say, here is the game, here's the boundaries, here are the rules, but we're involved in an infinite game. So dream about what the infinite game might be. And the third one is recognize that we are dealing with individuals who are being changed from one degree of glory into another, that is you and I, mm -hmm. and the congregations that we serve are not yet finished pro uh, products. And so there's a human element there that has effort and inertia and, emo and emotion and reactance involved in it. And, uh, and so trying to work out how can we work together to bring about these changes. So th that's, that's why I picked those three books. Cool. Thanks very much for coming in. Uh, oh, great. Lots. And I hope it helps everybody. Mm, I should just say, um, I've just started reading the, the draft edition of Stephen Driscoll's book on artificial mm. intelligence, mm. which is probably three, four months away from publication. But uh, I th he's, he's writing putting artificial intelligence in the framework of um, biblical theology. Mm. And uh, I think that's going to be a fascinating book in the, yes. in the around the middle of the year. Yeah. yeah. See, it's, it's just, what you are doing is you keep showing curiosity. And I fear that what we do is we keep dropping back to just repeating what we've always done. And there's right reasons to repeat what we've done because God gives us resources. Uh, but at the same time, you've always got to be curious about what is it that I am not paying attention to? And mm. so, you know, Stephen's book, I'm looking forward to reading as well. I knew it was in, it was in it's writing on, it's it. It's the, in the works and we're looking forward to it. Yeah. Archie Poole is our guest. He's the head of the ministry department at Sydney's Moore Theological College and also with the Centre for Ministry Development. My name's Dominic Steele. You've been with us on The Pastor's Heart. We will look forward to your company next Tuesday afternoon.